Uh, hello, everyone. This is a replay of the beginner special interest group meeting that I did in uh, February of 2020. All opinions in here are my own. They are not of the club or any of the manufacturers, most definitely. So uh, it's basically about selecting and using a, a new telescope uh, for beginners and delving a little bit into some more advanced topics and also what accessories are very useful. So let's get started. First off, a joke. <laughs> I'll just skip over this one. So generally, there are different types of telescopes, and each type has different characteristics. There are refractor telescopes, as shown in the upper left corner of this. Uh, that's the typical one with the lens on the front end and the eyepiece on the back end. Newtonian reflectors, named after Sir Isaac Newton, who, the inventor of them, are fairly simple in concept. The lower right-hand corner is an example of one where it has a large concave mirror uh, at the back of the optical tube, in this particular case, a uh, open truss tube. And then that reflects back to a secondary mirror that's a flat one that uh, pushes the image out to the side so you can view it. Compound telescopes are a little bit more complicated. They have a number of uh, corrector plates and lenses and mirrors and things that allow us to work with a shorter optical path. So take, let's take a look at each one of those general types of scopes. So first, the Newtonian design. That's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's an open tube. It can gather dust, and you can have a fair amount of dust appear on the mirror. Fortunately, that doesn't seem to affect images too much. Uh, they are bulky. They are large, usually, but they are lightweight because it's primarily an open tube with only a mirror on the back end. There are two optical surfaces, the primary mirror at the back end or the bottom of the optical tube, and then the secondary mirror, which is a small elliptical shaped flat mirror that uh, is up at the top end of the tube. So two surfaces, very simple. You don't have to have glass that has no aberrations throughout it or anything like that. Um, they do have a shorter focusing range than some other types of scopes, so it makes them a little bit more difficult for, uh, for imaging, but you know, they're very good optical scopes. And they do require the most frequent collimation or optical alignment of any of the general telescope types. But those of us that use Dobsonian uh, style scopes or Newtonian style scopes get used to that pretty quickly. So this is a picture of the uh, optical path. You can see the light comes in from the left side, reaches that concave mirror on the right hand side at the bottom of the optical tube, where it's concentrated down to this elliptical secondary mirror. And then that puts it out uh, through the eyepiece, which is on the side of the scope. So as you can see, the eyepiece is actually toward the front end of the telescope. The next design is a refractor design. This is the typical spyglass type design. Now, one characteristic of the, of the refractor design is that it's a really good one with very minimal uh, minimal diffraction uh, and generally are very good. You can get cheap scopes that aren't very good, but generally refractors are, are the ones that people want. These are basically a closed tube because they have the lens on the front end and an eyepiece on the back end. It is open at the focuser end unless you have the plug uh, in there or the diagonal in there or an eyepiece in there. There are different designs, uh, achromatic, apochromatic and just plain old designs. What is what this about is the number of the number of and types of lenses at the front end of it. Because if you took a lens cross section, it'd look like a prism. And like a prism, a lens refracts uh, different wavelengths of lights a little bit differently. So the different colors come to a focus at different spots in the uh, in the focal plane. Well, the problem with that is that causes color fringing. So if you only have a single lens, you're going to have a fair amount of color fringing. If you have an achromatic design, which uses two lenses of a special type uh, to reduce the amount of uh, refraction, uh, differences in refraction for the different colors. And then the apochromatic, it does that even better. Typically, an achromat has two lenses and apochromatic design has three lenses all together stacked up at the front end. Nice thing about these is there's very little to no diffraction because there's no central obstruction. So that has two advantages in that um, there's nothing to block the light path and that improves the contrast, that improves the lack of diffraction, uh, that just makes it generally look really nice. Uh, because it is a sealed tube, basically, it almost never needs collimation. That, that lens is mounted very cleanly and very securely into the front end of the scope. Thing about refractors are they're expensive, as you can see by some of the example prices on here, but everybody wants one, whether they have uh, a Newtonian or they have a uh, 
compound telescope, they want to have a refractor because of its characteristics. I'll look at its light path. This one actually is showing a uh, three lens, so it's a pochromatic design. So you can see there are three lenses stacked together at the front end of the tube on the left, and then the light path goes out the back end of the tube, and there, for comfort of viewing, there's a diagonal, and then that goes out through the eyepiece. So typically on a refractor, the eyepiece is at the back end of the telescope. The third general type of scopes are uh, compound telescopes. Schmidt Cassegrain and Maxitov Cassegrain designs are the typical types. Uh, there are pictures of both. Uh, on the right, there are two Maxitov Cassegrain designs, and on the left, there are two Schmidt Cassegrain designs. The overall characteristics of these are that they're much shorter. They're a closed tube, again, open only at the focus or at the back end. They're a short physical length because it's a folded light path. Uh, however, even though they're a short physical length, they're a very long focal ratio and a very long focal length, a surprisingly long focal length for the physical length of the tube. They do have a rather large central obstruction. It's larger on the Smith Kasher Green design than it is on the Matsatov Kasher Green design, but it's still a fairly large central obstruction on both of them, and that does affect the uh, contrast and diffraction. Uh, it does have a very wide focusing range, which makes it very nice for imaging. It does have, as I said before, a folded light path. And the nice part about it is it doesn't require collimation too often. Uh, and again, optical alignment very often. And the only thing that's needed for optical alignment on the Schmidt cast grains especially is adjusting the secondary mirror at the front end. And I'll show you the light path. So this is a particular picture of a Maxitov Cassegrain. This shows the, the Mac, uh, a Schmidt Cassegrain calls it a corrector plate. The Maxitov Cassegrain calls it a uh, different name and I'm drawing a blank on it, so I'll leave it alone right now. But anyway, that does affect the light coming in. And then it goes to a concave mirror, primary mirror at the back end. And in this case, there's a small reflective spot on the back side of that front uh, that front corrector plate, and then that reflects the light back out through the back end, again to a diagonal and to the eyepiece. Some uh, moving from the type of scopes to the types of mounts, there are two general types of mounts, uh, altitude azimuth mounts and equatorially mounted uh, mounts for telescopes. So the altaz is just what it says, up, down, left, right. Uh, those can be available in tripod types and also can be in something called a Dobsonian mount and we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. Uh, for Generally for photography or astrophotography you want to have an equatorial mount, typically a German equatorial mount uh, that does that and there are also fork mounts available. Let's get into a little bit of detail on some of those. Uh, on the alt as designs the characteristics are basically it goes up, down, left, right. Um, the picture on uh, shown on the screen right now is one of a computerized uh, side mount and it goes up, down, and left, right. Um, the thing is it's easier to understand. There aren't any weird angles that you're having things point at, um, but the problem with these are that they don't rotate with the sky. So the problem is you can't really use this for photography, maybe 10, 15 seconds or something like that. But after that, it'll start twisting uh, the image in the sky and you'll get trails instead of, uh, you know, dots for stars. Um, but the nice thing about it is generally you don't need to rotate the optic tu optical tube assembly for a Newtonian or the star diagonal for Schmidt cast grains because it's always pointing in the right direction no matter what part of the sky it's pointing at. Um, so that's a quick overview of, of the Altaz type design. Um, I mentioned earlier Dobsonian telescopes. Pictured here is John Dobson, who was the originator of the San Francisco sidewalk astronomers. Uh, started that a long time ago uh, in San Francisco, obviously. He did pass away on January 15th, uh, 2014, so a few years ago. But he had pioneered the concept of having very cheap, very large light buckets. Um, he's shown uh, with working with someone building one, you know, simply showing simple cardboard tubes for the optical tube assembly, simple uh, plywood for the base. Uh, you can even see the spider, the part that holds the diagonal mirror, is made out of uh, some uh, some wood pieces, small pieces of wood. So um, 
you know, it can be very, made very simple with household uh, particles, uh, household uh, materials. Um, on the left is a picture of one that uh, the editor of Sky and Telescope magazine had put together from those same type of materials and plans uh, a few months ago in April 2020. Another set of shots of how John Dobson made the original ones very cheap. Um, the total, the assembled version is on the left hand side. The picture just to the right of that large picture shows a record. That's the azimuth bearing. So a couple of pieces of plastic on the bottom and a record to make a bearing surface. Put those together with the uh, the mirror box on top, or the excuse me, the rocker box on top of it. He even uh, used a binocular eyepiece as a as an eyepiece for it. And for a finder, a simple little piece of wooden uh, wooden bracket with a couple of holes in it. So you can see they can be made very very cheaply. Uh, moving on to uh, more professional things. So this Alt, this Dobsonian type of uh, telescope has the problem that it's not equatorially mounted. You have to, uh, as stars are going across the sky, as the sky is rotating over us, uh, you have to step up over, step up and over, up and over, up and over, and then come back down. So the trouble is, that's not one clean motion in one axis, it's a motion in a couple of axes. Well, there is a variation for uh, Dobsonians that you can use. It's called a, a equatorial platform. It basically tilts the scope at a slight angle and it tracks the sky so that you can track uh, using one single axis. So uh, it does add a few inches of height to the scope because it's a mechanism that sits underneath the telescope base. Um, they are fairly expensive commercially, but they can be made uh, at home pretty easily. Uh, it helps uh, with viewing and keeping tracking the objects, but it doesn't help that well with astrophotography because it is uh, often a little bit shaky. Moving on to ones that work for uh, astrophotography, the German equatorial design, um, the, some of the characteristics of these are they're quite a bit heavier. Um, you can see the two models I have for examples here, that Ioptron one, it can hold 30 pounds of telescope plus finder scope plus cameras uh, and uh, as a payload, and it's about $1,200. Kind of on the very, very high end, the software BISC Paramount mount is has a 90 pound payload and it's rather more expensive so these things are rock solid and they track the sky very very well and this is what's necessary for some serious imaging they are heavy they are a little bit more cumbersome to store and also uh, because they have the optical uh, the, excuse me the uh, axis running through them pointing toward north it's at an angle you can see this uh, the the axis is is pointing toward north, that's the right ascension axis, and then the declination axis is the other turn. So you have to have things at an angle. So it's not as intuitive, the scope and the counterweight shaft move at weird angles, but it does track the sky very, very well. And quite often they are computerized, although less expensive ones don't have to be. Moving on to uh, scopes that are generally sold as a set with the mount and the telescope together uh, are fork designs. This is most commonly seen on Schmidt Cassegrains, as you can see on all of all three of these examples. These can be set up as altitude azimuth, as is shown here, or they could be set up as equatorial using it, something called an equatorial wedge. Um, they can be a little bit bulky, especially have the models like I'm shown on the right that have two arms on them. Um, but the advantage is there's no counterweight shaft and there's no large counterweight. And again, they are generally sold as an integrated system and they are generally computerized. Again, although again, older models or some lower cost models don't have to be computerized. To adapt a fork mount to become equatorially mounted instead of alt as mounted, you have a an equatorial wedge. And it's simply a thing that tilts it up for our, at Minnesota, our uh, latitude is 45 degrees. So it tilts the scope up at 45 degrees. Uh, and basically it allows that, that scope to track um, in one axis only. So it helps out. So that does help uh, allow you to do some uh, astrophotography with that. So there's a lot of things to consider, um, a lot of things to ask yourself when you're looking at buying a first scope. What do you want to do? Do you want to just observe or do you want to do something with astrophotography? Um, and if you're observing, do you just want to look at solar system object or do you want to look at deep sky objects? A bigger thing is budget. 
are you, have you made your decision that you're committed to the hobby or are you just kind of checking it out at this point and want to go cheap? Uh, does the sc first scope have to be your only scope? Um, you'll find that a number of dedicated astronomers will often have two or three or four different scopes or even more uh, and quite often different types of scope for different characteristics and different viewing sessions. So uh, it, does this have to be your only scope or can, are you allowing yourself a little bit of money to try out something and then you may try it a little bit later. Another thing to make sure that you uh, accommodate for in your budget is to get accessories because you can buy the scope but you do need some things to make it work with you. So let's take a look at a couple of inexpensive scopes. This one's called a Celestron Power Seeker 127 EQ. Those numbers mean it's 127 millimeter or 5 inches in diameter for the primary mirror and uh, EQ means it's on an equatorial mount. Now this is an example of a very low cost lightweight equatorial mount. It has a thousand millimeter focal length. Now if you take a look at this thing that optical tube is only 20 inches long or much less than that 39 inches that the thousand millimeter equates to. So how did they do this? Well there's actually something in there's a corrector lens inside the, the focuser tube uh, and that corrector lens optically lengthens out the focal length of the scope. Good thing is it makes it so it can come to focus and it makes it a longer focal length, but the bad thing is it is a horrible design. Do not buy one of these. If you buy one and you decide you don't want it, don't give it to someone because you're going to disappoint someone else because they're a very bad optical design. Um, Companion to that is a Celestron Power Seeker 70 EQ. So this is another starter scope, uh, relatively inexpensive. This one's a 70 millimeter uh, refracting telescope with a 700 millimeter focal length. And notice that the focal length is about the length of the op optical tube itself. So that matches up, that makes sense. It comes with a five by 24 finder scope, which is that little finder scope on the top, uh, just in front of the eyepiece. It's fairly useless. We'll talk about accessories and different types of finders a little bit later. Now, the interesting thing about these is the optical tube assembly itself isn't actually bad. Um, it's really the fact that it's on a very lightweight, very shaky mount that makes it very hard to find um, objects and track objects. So that's generally the problem with most of these department store type telescopes or Amazon type telescopes really is that they come with too light of a mount uh, and it's too shaky, it's too hard to track, it's too hard to get onto the object and it just really is frustrating. If you can get the optical tube itself without the mount and put it on a more robust mount it actually isn't bad. So one example of that, again, I just mentioned this Celestron Power Seeker 70 EQ. I said not to buy it, but guess what? In 2017, I bought one. Um, this is a picture of my daughter at, uh, we're out in uh, Wyoming at the eclipse in August 2017. And we use this scope with a something that's a home built thing called a sun funnel. If you notice uh, by her elbow there, instead of having an eyepiece on it, it has a little projector screen, a rear projection screen. So that's a picture of the, uh, the eclipse in a partial phase at the time. And uh, this worked very well for that purpose. It's a single purpose. I didn't want to actually destroy chance destroying a more expensive telescope. So it's an inexpensive scope that has the sun going right into it and projecting its image onto that screen. So anyway, you can uh, consider those for that sort of thing. Uh, but for actual dark sky use, I'd recommend against it. So again, different types of uh, beginner telescopes to avoid and why. The Jonesbird style Newtonian reflectors. Uh, a couple of examples here, but that's that one that has a very short optical tube length as compared to its focal length. And it has that corrector lens inside the focus tube. That's called a Jones, Jones Birds design. Uh, can try to avoid that at all purposes, all, uh, at all costs. Uh, in general, small department type, de department score or Amazon reflectors on anything on a cheap altitude azimuth mount. Um, here's an example of a Mead Polaris 130 EQ. Um, small department store reflectors on cheap equatorial mounts. So the, like uh, the one that I just had on the screen in that past slide. So basically low cost mounts are the worst killer of low cost telescopes. 
However, if you've already bought one, there is hope. Um, this is an example of a wooden alt as mount that I adapted onto an existing tripod for an existing telescope. So uh, you can take one of those low cost scopes and if you have some woodworking skills, you can actually build an alt as mount that's more robust and it, uh, it doesn't track, but it does allow you to point the scope pretty easily. And if you add where I have that, sh that uh, shaft in the middle of that disc, if you add a tension spring on there, you can actually end up adjusting the tension and adjusting the friction as you go up and down. So it'll uh, stay located where it's supposed to be pointed at very easily. And we had the article in the February 2011 Gemini if you wanted to build one. So let's take a look at some scopes that you'd like to buy for beginner scopes. So here are a few examples of some good uh, big bang for the buck type non-computerized starting scopes. The very first one is from Astronomers Without Borders. Uh, it's called their One Sky Telescope. It's a five inch uh, or 130 millimeter uh, diameter and it's in a short tube but that's okay in this case because the short tube extends out on those two poles to the right focal length. So nice compact scope for carrying around and it's about $200 and that's an excellent cost. A number of MES members have those. Uh, it's a great little portable scope, uh, low cost, good value for what it is. Another one is uh, the Orion Star Blast. Um, this one's actually used in the library lending programs where it's uh, modified a little bit with a, uh, a zoom eyepiece on it and things that could be taken off or moved or lost are uh, are fastened permanently onto it so it can be put out as a, uh, a lending scope from a, from an actual uh, public library. Um, relatively inexpensive scope so it can't see dark deep sky objects but it's good for working with and it's a uh, relatively inexpensive and it's nice it's a nice robust mount for this size of telescope. Moving up a little bit are the um, the larger Dobsonian. So I've got depicted here a six inch and an eight inch diameter Dobsonian. Uh, these happen to be from Orion, but there are good ones from a number of other vendors as well. These again are a little bit bulky, but they're a good bang for the buck and they generally come, uh, uh, they come well equipped typically. So uh, those are the typical type of starting scopes and actually those Dobsonian scopes that I just had on, they could work for many years and you'd be happy with them. While I was researching some of those inexpensive scopes to have examples, I ran across ones I hadn't seen before. This is called the Celestron Star Sense Explorer series. They were recently put out, but what they do is they are, came with a bracket to mount your smartphone on and that bracket has a, has a mirror that allows the camera on your smartphone to look at the sky pointing in the same direction as the telescope. And then on that smartphone, they have an app that acts as a finder. So you can see two examples of this. They actually have four different scopes. One is a five inch or 130 millimeter F5 Newtonian reflector. So it's not the Bird Jones type one. So it's a good reflector. And the one on the right is a refracting telescope, a 102 millimeter or four inch F6.5 refractor. Again, up they're both about the same price at about $400. And that includes the license for that app on your phone. Um, actually is not a bad value if you want to go that route. I have a couple of uh, slides on information. When I first learned of this, I saw on Cloudy Nights, there was a huge discussion thread on this, probably 15 plus pages uh, talking about it. So I won't spend time going through all of these. You can pause the recording and read any of this, but you can simply go to cloudynights.com and on their forums, search for Star Sense Explorer and you'll find this entire one number of questions and answers within that uh, discussion forum about what how it'll work, uh, what are the light pollution limits, how tolerant is it to kicks and vibration, things like that. And all uh, a few more questions here about uh, disruptions. So uh, that first answer is it talks about plate solves. That means that it's taking a picture and it's comparing the picture that it takes with its internal maps and determining where it's pointing. So uh, it actually ends up working pretty well. Also, there were some user comments from a, a, a user, Mike, from a telescope store in Denver, and he was talking about using it and it um, worked as he, as, uh, as was advertised. 
So the StarSense Explorer also has two smaller telescopes. On the left is an uh, is a refractor type. It's an 80 millimeter uh, refractor tube with a very lightweight uh, alt as mount. The right side is one of those 114 millimeter, millimeter Bird Jones Newtonian reflectors. So the one on the right, I would avoid at all costs, at least unless you're going to use pieces of this and not use the, the optical tube itself. But uh, really, it's on a shaky mount, and it's a, not a very good optical design for that reflector. Now, having said all of that, I actually, myself, after I read about this, I purchased the uh, LT-80AZ, the refractor version. And I found out that the optical tube assembly itself is pretty decent for the price. The bracket is very robustly built. The application works very well. And what I did was I mounted it, I made an adapter to mount it to my larger telescope. So I'm using the bracket, the smartphone app, uh, and my own telescope. And I also took the optical tube assembly, took it off of this very shaky mount and uh, put a dovetail on it so I can put it on a more robust mount. And with those two pieces of that, I'm happy with that piece. However, the mount itself is useless and uh, that's about where that's at. So moving up a little bit, if you don't want to go with the low cost reflector uh, type of direction and you want to have a computerized scope, these are some typical uh, low to mid-range uh, uh, computerized Schmidt cast grains. On the left is a Celestron uh, 8SE or 6SE, a 6-inch or an 8-inch Schmidt cast grain. The middle is a mid 8-inch uh, Schmidt cast grain. And on the right is a 6-inch or an 8-inch uh, Celestron Schmidt cast grain on an equatorial mount called the Advanced VX equatorial mount. So you can see prices go up a little bit when you get to this point, but this is the point where you can start considering doing some rudimentary imaging with it, and it's also uh, provides some pretty good portability. Moving back to talk about some of the Dobsonian designs. So Dobsonians generally don't have um, go-to capabilities. If you had a large one like this trust tube Dobsonian there or one of the other scopes, you could do something like that Star Sense Explorer if you're handy at adapting existing things for a different purpose. Or you can purchase what are called digital setting circles, DSCs. Um, here are a couple of examples. The one in the middle in that with a white background is called a Sky Commander. Uh, the one to the right of it with the red screen is called a Nexus DSC. The one to the right of that that says Wildcard on it, that's an Argo Navis. That's the higher end uh, digital setting circle computer. So that plus the encoders that are in that gray background picture to the left of the Sky Commander, um, those provide the encoders for determining where it, the scope is pointing in altitude and azimuth and feeding that information to the computer so that it can tell you how to point the scope. So you can use it as a push to type of thing or if you want on larger telescope, telescopes, especially like that large trust tube Dobsonian shown uh, to the left, uh, you can add something called a servo cat, which provides servos drive to allow it to be not only uh, computerized, but also to be a full go-to system. So the Argo Navis and the ServoCAD is what the MAS has on all of our larger scopes. We have a system set up on the 24-inch Starmaster at Cherry Grove. We have that set up on the 20-inch uh, Obsession Telescope at Eagle Lake. And we also have the same setup on the 25 and the 30-inch Obsession Telescopes at Long Lake Conservation Center. So that's a little bit on scopes and getting into some of the accessories. Let's take a look at what uh, accessories you need to start out with and which ones can be put off till a little bit later. So here's the list of accessories that I like to consider. So let's first take a look at eyepieces. So eyepieces can be a large wallet drain, depending on how many you get and what quality you get. What I have depicted here are the typical starting out uh, eyepieces and can work for a very long time. These are plossels. Uh, the consideration is these have, a, a, the, you know, they're a good value for what they what they cost. They are, are a four element in two group design. Uh, they typically come as coated lenses, so they have 
uh, that reduces the internal reflections, and they just provide a good value for the money. Um, the overall considerations of eyepieces are what is the focal length and what that means what's the magnification, what's the apparent field of view. Like when you look through the eyepiece, how much does it look like you can see? Does it look like looking through a soda straw or does it look like looking through a, a porthole? a uh, really wide one. Another consideration is eye relief, which is how far away the uh, the eye lens can be from your eye and still provide a view, and also the exit people. We'll talk about those considerations in a second. So the first one is focal length and magnification. So basically you take the telescope's focal length, say it's a uh, thousand millimeter focal length and an eyepiece focal length, the 10 millimeter focal length, you divide a thousand by 10, and get 100 power. Uh, from practical examples here, a Schmidt uh, a Celestron C8 Schmidt Cassegrain with a 2032 millimeter focal length. As you can see that because of that folded light path, even though it's a short tube, it has a very long focal length. If you take that 2032 millimeter focal length divided by a 24 millimeter Televu Panoptic and you get uh, about 85 power. A small telescope, this Astrotech AT72 is a very short, um, 72 millimeter refractor, if we, and that gives me a 432 millimeter focal length. If I divide that by 24 millimeter Teleview Plossel, or Panoptic, excuse me, the same, same one, that'll only give me 18 power. So the magnification is definitely related to both the uh, focal length of the telescope and the focal length of the eyepiece. So you can come up with a good selection of eyepieces for different magnifications. Uh, just depending on uh, what you do for calculating it. Um, I mentioned few, field of view. So you can see on these gray at the bottom here, you can have one that looks like a soda straw. So you can have an actual field of view of like a half a degree and a parent field of view of 30 degrees. Um, so this is uh, the 30 degrees is the apparent field of view. So that's how wide it appears in the eyepiece. Or you can have a Plossel, which would be about 50 to 52 millimeter, or excuse me, degree field of view, or you can have a premium eyepiece with a 60 degree field of view. So you can see, um, if you look at the very left hand one, that was an actual field of view of a half degree, an apparent field of view of 30 degrees, and you move to the right side, that's an actual field of view of one degree. So it's twice as wide as that half a degree moon. Um, excuse me, the actual field of view one degree. So it's, you know, twice as wide as the moon and the apparent field of view is 60 degrees. So you can see the moon is the same size, but you've got a lot of black space around it. In the center, um, the actual field of view a half a degree, the apparent field of view 60 degrees. So you can fill up the moon and get more detail. Uh, above that in the red box, the to calculate this, you take the eyepiece's apparent field of view, which is, um, well, if it's a Plossel, it's 50 degrees and uh, other designs, premium designs, they'll tell you what the apparent field of view is. And you divide that by the magnification to determine what the true field of view is. So again, using that same Celestron C8 optical tube and the Astrotech 72 uh, refractor tube. So we put a 24 millimeter panoptic in there. Uh, 60 degree is the apparent field of view divided by 84.6 power is 1.01 true field of view. So we see 1.01 degrees of the sky. Again, that little short focal length uh, AT72, that same 24 millimeter panoptic, 68 degree apparent again still, divided by 18 power is 3.7 degree field of view. So that's almost uh, the field of view of a, uh, of a uh, binocular, uh, kind of a high power binocular. Third thing to consider is eye relief. This isn't a big deal if you don't have glasses, but if you do have glasses, think of that illustration in the bottom that you've got to have your eyeglass lens in between you and that eyepiece. So if there's not enough room for your eye eyeglasses to go between that, you've got too short of a uh, eye relief. Um, for Plossal eyepieces, the longer focal lengths, the 18, 20, 24, 25, 30 degree, um, or excuse me, um, uh, millimeters. <laughs> Sorry about that. The uh, you know the anything from 18 to 
30 millimeter focal length, they have enough field uh, eye relief to work with you. If you get down to four or six or eight millimeter focal length on those eyepieces, the eye lens is smaller and also the, the eye relief is much smaller too. So short focal length, Plossels may have a problem. For the more premium eyepieces, you have to take a look at what all of the calculations are for the specific eyepiece. Another one to consider is exit pupil. How wide is that that beam of light coming out of the eyepiece going into your eye? Uh, if you're over 50 or so, the maximum amount that your pupil can dilate is on the order of four to five, possibly six millimeters. Well, if you have something that puts out eight millimeters of light, a, a beam of light that's eight millimeters wide, a lot of that's falling on your iris and it's going to waste. So we take a look at these numbers again, you can see 2.4 millimeter is well within that. So you get a good view, you don't waste any light. And with the panoptic in the AT72, that's four millimeters. So that's right at the edge. So looking at some eyepieces that we actually have in our inventory in the MES and in a couple of telescopes we use at the MES, you can see an example. Um, so these are ones down at Cherry Grove, the 24 inch Starmaster, the bad, uh, and in the 16 inch LX200 Classic also at Cherry Grove. So you can see uh, the various focal lengths range from 55 down to 10 millimeter. The apparent field of view on these premium eyepieces is much larger than we talked about. You notice the 50 millimeter of a Teleview Plossel 55, 82 millimeter, or excuse me, degree of the Nagler, 68 degree of the Panoptics, and 100 degrees of the Ethos. So these have some very wide field of views, kind of looking at a space portal. You can see they have different magnifications, so you uh, determine what the field of views are. So you can see we have a range of, of eyepieces on a couple of different scopes that give us pretty different characteristics. So looking at those, some of those premium eyepieces, I've mentioned Teleview. We, most of the MES premium eyepieces are Televiews at all of, all of the uh, observing sites, either Naglers or Panoptics or Ethos or uh, not too many Delos or Delights. But they're a proprietary design and they have a very wide apparent field of view. There are other good ones out there, Explorer Scientific, uh, quite a few different brands out there, Pentax, Stellarview, Bader, Vixen, quite a few others. So um, eyepieces can begin become a, uh, a drain on the wallet uh, and you have to get pretty careful about selecting the eyepieces unless you want to spend a huge amount of money. But they're definitely worth it because you can't, even with a bad telescope, if you put a good, good eyepiece in it, you'll see a lot more than you can with a good eye, good telescope with a bad eyepiece in it. Moving on to the optical finder scopes. So up at the upper left hand corner is the typical finder scope that comes with relatively inexpensive scopes. It's a six power by 30 millimeter uh, one. It's a fairly small amount, six power and 30 millimeter objective lens gives you a pretty decent view, but it's a little bit hard to find things. Generally, people will, will uh, graduate on to larger finder scopes. You can see the lower left stellar view nine by 50, an Orion 9x50 and uh, even a less expensive 6x30 right angle one. So these, you, instead of having to hunker down and look along the optical path of the scope, you can have these right angle ones, either correct image or not correct image. Uh, these are all happen to be correct image ones that, that uh, as you move the scope up in the sky, the image goes up instead of going the opposite direction like a refracting telescope normally goes. Uh, but anyway, these can help quite a bit uh, in your viewing. One of the things I recommend is to first get some kind of a zero power uh, finder. Um, if you have a larger telescope on the right hand side, that thing's called a Telrad. And basically you can see the reticle pattern in the middle of this slide that shows, you'll see this red pattern projected in light on the sky. As you look through that window, you'll see that projected on the sky. So no magnification, but it allows you to keep both eyes open, have your head of, you know, a foot or so behind the thing and just line up this pattern on the sky. If it's a, if you have a smaller telescope, there's an equivalent called a Rigel Quick Finder. That's the thing right below that Telred reticle pattern. That one uh, stands up a little bit off the tube. Um, it's a smaller one, a little bit harder to, to see it. It's approximately the same price, but uh, it, it provides a target as well. 
Moving to the left, you'll see two different styles of red dot finders. So these are similar to the red dot finder that you'll find on some BB guns and some 22s and things like that. But basically, you look through that little window and it projects a red dot on the sky. Sometimes they're called Mars finders too, because Mars looks often like a red dot. But I recommend having one of these on your telescope because it makes it uh, getting in the vicinity so much easier. And to be able to get into the vicinity, you have to be able to read the charts. And to read the charts, you have to have a flashlight. You can go very inexpensively getting an LED flashlight and either using fingernail polish or paint and paint the uh, lens. Or you can get a plastic film like Monocoat for coating uh, from covering model airplanes or something like that and putting it behind the lens. Uh, so there's a number of things you can do. The one I like the most is the Celestron in the... Um, that picture on the right hand side, uh, which has two LEDs in it and it's a variable light so you can get it very dim once your eyes have adapted. And also uh, what I do is I take the plastic lens and I put a couple of layers of uh, scotch tape on them to diffuse the light out so it, it's a more even light. But you can do a lot of things with, with flashlights but bottom line is you pretty much have to have one. What you have to have it for is to be able to see the uh, what's in the sky. So for planispheres, and that the planet isn't for planet, but it's really for a plane. So it's showing what a sphere looks like on a plane. And that's where the root of that word comes from. You can go from anything from free do-it-yourself, build-yourself ones. Um, that Uncle Al star, star Wheel is one that you can get paper, put it, print it out on heavy paper and put it together yourself and it works very well. Uh, or if you want something that's already set up for the for the particular time and gives you some additional guides, the evening sky map, uh, skymaps.com is printed every month. And the nice part about it, because it's every month for every year, the planets, because they move around in the different sky, they don't show up on normal planispheres, but the evening sky map, it shows where the planets are going to be for that month. Moving to the right are some star wheels or planispheres. Uh, sky and Telescope makes one. Uh, and there are a number of other ones out there that range from, actually even range from 4 inches to 8 inches to 16 inches in diameter. But it's really useful having a planisphere to find out where you are looking in the sky and what's up in the sky on any given night. Together with that, you'll probably want to have star charts or star atlases. A popular one is the Sky and Telescope Pocket Atlas. I think it's around $20 or thereabouts. Another book that's really good is Objects in the Heavens. And if you don't want to spend much money, uh, on the MAS Beginner SIG forum, we have a number of links. And the link uh, to, a, uh, to the mag 7 star atlas which is in cloudy nights uh, you print these out preferably you can print it on an, any uh, inkjet printer but it looks a little bit better on a good uh, laser printed printer because there is some small type and small imaging on that but it's uh, approximately 15 or 16 pages you can put them in page protectors and you can you know pull them out and hold it up to the sky at the right orientation and the, these work out very well for me for example of course, being it's uh, 2020 when I'm recording this, apps and programs, apps for smartphones and programs for planetariums or planetarium programs for PCs and things are very uh, popular. And there are a lot of them out there, both uh, purchased ones and for free. So one thing uh, we get a fair amount of do. Remember when when it's a clear sky quite often there's going to be due at night and you have to take care of it uh, or you're, you'll end your viewing session prematurely. You can start out with a cheap 12 volt hair dryer or if you have a long extension cord or regular hair dryer, but quite often people want to equip uh, themselves with dew control, a dew shield on the Smith Kasha grain or a uh, refractor or um, do heaters on those as well. Here I've got some examples of both commercial ones. So if you look above that AstraZap thing, uh, to the left is a commercial eyepiece heater. It has Velcro and it wraps around an eyepiece. You can home make these as well. Um, the right hand one has a fairly ugly uh, piece of wire, white wire with it, but uh, there's a resistor ladder in there and then it's covered up with um, with some duct tape, uh, Gorilla tape. So you can use that and then wrap it around your, your eyepiece. So uh, lower right hand picture is shown those two in use actually.
So you can go more expensive or you can go less expensive. One characteristic that you have to worry about with the commercial IP heaters is you have to have a dew heater controller to reduce it because these have a lot of wattage in them. And if you just plug it in directly to a 12 volt source, uh, it will get way too hot. You don't have to have a lot of heat. It just has to get a little bit above ambient to keep the dew off. So this Astra Zap is one brand of controller plugs into a 12 volt battery. And then it uh, then the dew heaters plug into that and you can control them with a the rheostat. Of course, you've got to have the power, so you can uh, plug it into your car if it's nearby, or you can use pretty much anything. Um, you can use something like the Celestron power tank, or they have a new version that's a lithium battery, so it takes up less space. Or if you're handy, you can make something like that one in the center, or you can take a, a jump start battery and add a few jacks to it and make your own. So there are a lot of things you can do uh, for powering dew control. Um, even though uh, we like the view in the summer, there's quite often uh, we're going to go outside in, in the fall and the winter times when you're going to get a little bit colder. So uh, keeping warm is really important, obviously. Remember that because astronomy is a fairly, uh, well, you're not moving around a whole lot, you you do feel the cold a lot faster than if uh, you're just outside in a winter day during the sun because there's no solar load, obviously, and you're not moving around much colder faster. It feels like it's 10 to 20 degrees colder than it really is. So uh, one thing that's nice is getting mittens with the uh, uh, flap that can go over these open open uh, fingertips. And also just get the uh, those little heat packages um, those little uh, heat uh, hand warmers uh, that you can get at any outdoor store. So a lot of things like that. Also for staying comfortable, um, some kind of a specialized chair. You can go inexpensive with the homemade one that's shown here, a Denver observing, observing chair, or you can go with one that's really nice. There's one from Cat's Perch, which is the center picture here. And then you can also go with a metal one uh, Astronomics has one, and also the one that's depicted is actually a musician's chair that's a little bit less expensive uh, available on Amazon. Why do you want to be sitting? Um, especially if you're not as flexible as you used to be when you were younger, sitting means you're going to stay steady, which means a steadier view, and you can see more. It's almost like getting another couple of inches of aperture by being able to be steady sitting there uh, in comfort looking at the, the objects you're looking at. Another thing about staying comfortable is dealing with mosquitoes, but the good thing is they generally only seem to hap happen perhaps uh, the first hour after after sunset. Uh, have some repellent with you, and if you want, there's something called the bug shirt. It basically covers you up. It's got elastic at the waist, it's got elastic at the hands, and it has a, a hood that covers up with a zipper that you can open up to uh, get at the eyepiece. For Newtonians especially, you have to maintain uh, optical alignment or collimation. Now there are a number of tools for this. In the center is the most used tool. It's a laser mate is the Orion brand, but it's available in a number of brands too. But basically it's a laser pointer in a housing that fits in the eyepiece, in, in the eyepiece focuser. So um, basically it, it shines a laser beam down the middle of the tube so you can align the secondary and then align the primary and uh, make sure that it's all together. The upper right hand corner of this shows an, uh, an optical tube which is the way that we did it in the past before we had the lasers. The lower left hand corner shows augmenting that laser with something called a barload laser collimator, collimation system. That little white disc with the dot in the middle of it, that dot is actually a lens, it's a barlow lens, and it magnetically hooks to the bottom side of that, that two inch uh, laser collimator. And instead of having a laser beam coming back from the primary, it sends back a uh, reflection of basically the shadow of the of the uh, center spot on your primary. So you center that up and it's much easier to do and it's much more accurate. The lower right hand corner of this is showing the typical um, old fashioned collimation using the sight tube. But with no Newtonians, it's really important and you can use the laser collimators and the sight tubes. Schmidt Cassegrains, you don't have to do it nearly as often, but you have to do it a little bit differently. You cannot use a laser, you have to do star collimation. So there are artificial stars available out there or 
you can do it with a real star at night. Uh, if you want to do it during the day, obviously, you'd have to use an artificial star, which can range from a flashlight with a metal disc in the front where the lens is with one little hole poked through it, so it's a very narrow beam, to it could be also a, a, a silver Christmas tree bulb mounted quite a ways away with a light flat, uh, shining on it. So you're looking at that reflection of the light in that Christmas tree bulb. So there are a lot of different things you can do to adjust the, uh, to generate the light source for a schmidt green collimation. But no matter what, you want to have good collimation because if it's not collimated, you're going to get fuzzy views, maybe even coma. Uh, it's just not going to be a, a good observing experience. Um, also keeping things clean. So there are a lot of things you do, can do for keeping eyeglasses or eyeglasses. You can use a, this lens pen, which is designed for eyeglasses, but it also works on eye, um, on the eyepieces. Uh, the lens wipes that for, are for eyeglasses, you can use those on, on the eyepiece surfaces and things like that. For Newtonian telescopes, uh, again, I mentioned because they're an optical tube that's open, you can get a lot of dust on it, but once every year or two years or thereabouts, you have to clean it to get the big chunks off at minimum. Uh, the materials for that are pretty in, pretty inexpensive and very read, readily available. A uh, couple of gallons of distilled water and a little bit of Dawn dish soap and some cotton balls. Have one gallon of the dis, distilled water and put a couple of drops in it for for getting that, you wash it off and you use the cotton balls to just kind of wipe the dirt off. And you do that until it's clean and then in your and then you rinse it with pure distilled water. For Schmidt Cassegrain corrector plates, you know, generally they're a closed tube, so the, the primary inside is no problem. It doesn't get dirty, but the corrector plate can get dirty. And that can be a little bit intimidating. Well, there's something called eclipse optic cleaning fluid, which evaporates very, very fast. So you use that along with something called a peck pad, which is a very nice ultra soft lint free cloth. You wet the peck pad, wipe it very lightly on the thing and clean off the corrector plate. Again, these don't have to be done very often. You can get by with a fair amount of dirt, but if you have something that looks like it's going to stain it or something, it's a good idea to clean it. But um, these are the good materials to do that. Um, past that, keeping organized. Now, this is a very open-ended part of the discussion. You can do a lot of different things to keep things organized. You can have one of those big carrying cases. You can just have individual boxes. Um, you can do a lot of things, but have an inventory list, have a packing checklist, most especially so you don't forget something, and have a few you know places for some spare parts and accessories. Um, in helping that and keeping things running, it's nice to grab a few spare lens caps. You can buy them sometimes at uh, stores, but one place that's good is iCaps icaps.com or something like that. I've got that in the, in a following slide. Also some spare screws. One place I like a lot is Scope Stuff, where he has a lot of things. It's not a very pretty website, but he has a lot of accessories available. This particular one is a little bag with a, a uh, assortment of color-coded nylon set screws so that I can use those as a reference. And then I can have another collection of set screws over time so that I know which one I have to get or which one I have to buy at a hardware store if I lose something. Also, if you have anything with electronics, if it's got the digital setting circles or if it has dew heaters or if it's a computerized scope or things like that, it's nice to have a small inexpensive multimeter around uh, some things for emergency repairs like electrical tape or duct tape and some small tools, things like that. Again, these aren't necessary, but it's nice in case, especially if you're going on a long observing session over a couple of days. And of course, a lot of things run on batteries, so have spare batteries. Um, nice way to, to store some of them, like triple A's, they can be stored in an eyepiece case, or even double A's can be stored in a larger eyepiece case. Um, and finally, adapting and fixing, finding the various widgets. I mentioned scopestuff.com is one place that I love. Ipiececaps.com is what I was trying to see a few seconds ago. Another site that's good is Agena Astro and also astrosystems.biz. That gold color laser collimator with the Barlow attachment that I mentioned earlier, that one came from astrosystems.biz. Um, and for a lot of other links, go to our web page in the uh, beginner SIG forum. Right toward the top, we have a, uh, a tagged one that I have dozens and dozens of links of places you can go to, including these ones to the left.
And with that, I think that covers it. So again, take a look at what kind of a scope you, you're looking for. What do you want to observe? Do you want to do planetary? Do you want to do deep sky observing? Do you want to do just visual? Do you want to do imaging? Um, really, the best advice I can do besides all of the stuff we just went through is go to one of the star parties, meet up with some of the other MES members, talk to them, see what works for them and what doesn't work for them, what they like and what they don't like. Everybody is willing to give you an opinion and you can integrate a number of those opinions together and figure out what's best for you. So I hope this uh, presentation was of some use to you and uh, we'll hope to see you at uh, one of our star parties coming up soon. Bye now.